All right. So let's go back into it as it relates to some of the roles or functions of the cerebral cortex. Now, I alluded to in the previous video when we talked about the different lobes of the cerebral cortex, right? About the motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex. So some of what I'm about to say is familiar, but I'm also gonna talk about association areas and the concept of language functioning. So here we go. So the motor cortex is the farthest posterior or rear part of the frontal lobe. And as I said, it's responsible for sending a message or an impulse from the brain down to the spinal cord and out to the periphery. So the muscles and glands that are outside of the central nervous system. Now, who helped us better understand the motor cortex? Well, it starts with uh, Fritz and Hitzig, which stimulated different parts of the motor cortex. And he noticed different body parts would twitch, right? In the this part of the motor cortex might have a twitch in the arm. Another part of the motor cortex might have a twitch in the leg. And he wrote his findings saying, hey, there are different parts of the motor cortex responsible for triggering stimulation to different body parts. But it was Wilder Penfield who did it more systematically, where he mapped out every part of the motor cortex and labeled what they were um, able to do. He also discovered that different parts of the body were given more real estate, so to speak, or more larger part of the motor cortex than others. And what he figured was that uh, the regions that required more bodily control got more space on the cortex. Now, behind the motor cortex is the somatosensory cortex. And that sends uh, impulses from the periphery up to the brain as it relates to pressure, touch, temperature, and pain, as I said. Uh, and so these are your inputs to the brain. They're next to one another. I said that the motor cortex and the sensory cortex are next to one another, therefore they're going to talk to one another or have cross communication. So we oftentimes refer to this as the sensory motor cortices, right? So that allows us to acknowledge the interplay between the two. So now if we were to look at uh, a brain, in pink, you're looking at the motor cortex. So again, if I'm gonna use my cursor, this pink is the motor cortex. On the other side, it's also happening, right? Because we have two hemispheres. And then on, in the uh, lighter blue, we have our somatosensory cortex, right? So that's uh, input of touch. Now, if you were to look at uh, the mapping of Wilder Penfield, he was able to identify that right around here is where our toes, ankles, knees, hips, trunk of our body, hand, face, tongue, and swallowing responses were. So it's kind of the best way to describe this as if you were hanging on the monkey bars uh, from a playground with, from your feet and you're flipped upside down, right? So that's what it looks like. And sure enough, similar to the motor cortex, the somatosensory cortex is mapped the same way. So we call this uh, topographic mapping, right? And what we see is both the motor cortex and the somatosensory cortex are virtually identical, virtually identical. Now there is one exception. And if you were to look next to the toes 
on the somatosensory cortex, there's the genitals. Now in the motor cortex, it's not there, uh, but in this somatosensory cortex, it is. Now, if you were to ask, well, why is that? It's It deviates from the classic organization of the body. I would say we don't know, but I would say that when people find foot massages to be sensual, perhaps the cross communication between the feet and the genitals is what's happening at the somatosensory cortex. Perhaps that's one of our explanations. Now, we also have to understand that the brain has uh, association areas and projection areas. Association areas are where different parts or met parts of the brain converge on a specific region and they combine input. So I mentioned something called the angular gyrus, which is one of those association areas for, for language, right? But uh, we also have projection areas, which sends impulses at a distance. Association areas are coming together at a common point. Projection areas are we send it out to at a distance. So if we were to think of the motor cortex, right, uh, as sending a message from the brain down to the spinal cord and out to the muscles and glands, it's the impulse is traveling a great distance. Okay, so that's the difference between association and projection areas. Now let's talk about language. Language, we have five parts of the brain that are responsible uh, for the language pathway. So we talked about V1. In the occipital lobe, uh, the visual area is responsible for seeing the words. Now, what you see in the in, in V1 is just a symbol. It isn't actually words, but you have to take these written symbols and convert them into auditory code, right? So uh, as we move out from the occipital lobe to um, the parietal and temporal lobes, you have a, a an association area called the angular gyrus. And that's responsible for making it uh, the visual language meaningful as if it were auditory. From the angular gyrus, we have input to a Broca's area, and that's for uh, speech and language comprehension, as we said. After you see something that's written, you understand it, maybe you might have questions. And in order for you to ask your questions, you need uh, motor functioning and Broca's area. So Broca's area is your ability to pronounce or produce the word, and the motor's, motor cortex is responsible for co controlling the parts of the tongue, right? So. In language, there are five different parts of the brain active. And here's a summary slide. And that seems like a good place to stop in terms of the functions of the different parts of the brain. Now, actually, before I stop, I want to dispel a myth. There is a myth out there that we only use about 10% of our brain. And that is not true. As you have seen, each part of the brain does something. Each part of the brain allows us to function in a meaningful way. And humor me for a second. A basic task like driving, you will activate in that process all of the different brain regions at one point or another. So imagine you're driving. Well, the uh, medulla is responsible for vital functioning. You can't drive without breathing and uh, having heart, uh, cardiac function, digestion, things like that. 
the pawns and in the reticular formation in particular are for attention and alertness, right? You're going to need the reticular formation and the pawns to be able to focus on the road. The cerebellum is for fine motor control. Uh, so you're going to need to be able to steer the wheel. The inferior and superior colliculi are sensory motor reflexes. So visual and auditory reflexes are at play. You might get hungry or thirsty. And there are people who eat on the go. So here you're driving and you decide you want to take a bite of a, a donut. That's your hypothalamus telling you you're hungry. Your thalamus is passing all the messaging throughout the brain. Uh, you need to remember where you went. So in the limbic system, you have your hippocampus. You got to remember your process of getting from point A to point B. You might get cut off and someone might um, curse at you. Well, that road rage is the amygdala, right? And the um, we talked about the hypothalamus. And then we go up to basal ganglia, which is responsible for uh, other motor movement. So uh, Parkinsonian symptoms are linked to basal ganglia, but movement in general. And then we get to the forebrain and we have to be able to see the road. So the visual cortex is there. We have to be able to hear other people honking the horn. So the temporal lobe is there. We have to be able to understand uh, spatial awareness. So the parietal lobe is there. And then we have to uh, be able to uh, steer on a cortical level, which is our motor cortex. And we have to make like good planning decision making, which is our prefrontal cortex. So I've literally marched from the bottom of the brain up and out to every part of the brain. And a simple task like driving could activate all of the different regions. So what do you think about that? Is that a good um, logic against, oh, you only use 10% of your brain? Pretty good, right? So. Um, that seems uh, like a, a solid proof. And if anyone ever says, oh, I heard we only use 10% of their, your brain, you might think, you know, well, maybe you, but not me, right? We all use 100% or nearly all of our brain. So that's a good place to stop. And I'm actually going to stop for the break here.